When the mountains fall and the sea turns around, but my world stands strong, says the Lord. When the world gets tough, filled with broken hearts, but my love won't fail, says the Lord. Oh, My word stands strong, says the Lord. When the world gets tough, feel the broken heart. But my love won't fail, says the Lord. Your love is powerful.
hear them singing. The people they're rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Praises heard around the world. Can't you hear? Come on. Can't you hear them? Hear them singing. The people they're rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing hallelujah. Welcome to another virtual service here with the Manchester International Church of Christ. I also want to welcome our brothers and sisters in the church in Leeds and in the Wirral. And wherever you're joining us from today, we are so glad that you've decided to be with us. Today's title is Be Strong and Courageous. And of course, this is mentioned four different times in Joshua chapter 1, which is what we're going to study today. We have begun our final theme for the, the end of the year, and that's studying the book of Joshua. And uh, we've had a teaching day on the book of Joshua. We've had some introductory lessons. But today we're going to dig into chapter 1 and really study this theme, Be Strong and Courageous. I, I really believe that at this time in our world, it's an appropriate theme. And I know it's a very challenging time uh, for so many people uh, living today. And so I pray that if this uh, video doesn't find you feeling strong and feeling courageous, that perhaps something we share today from the Word of God uh, will inspire and encourage your faith. You know, in our invitation today for the service, we put an eagle soaring through the sky. I've always heard throughout my life that when a storm comes, the eagle soars above the storm. And so I looked it up, and this is what I found. When the storm comes, the eagle adjusts its wings so that the wind will pick it up and lift it above the storm. When the storm rages beneath, the eagle is soaring above. The eagle does not escape the storm. It uses the storm to lift it higher. And so, again, my hope today is that uh, whatever storm of life you might be going through, uh, perhaps we can't remove that storm, but something we read will inspire your faith and allow you to soar above the storm. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then I've asked our dear brother James Kalu to read Joshua chapter 1 for us, and then we'll dive into our lesson. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we are so grateful to be able to come before you today and to study your scriptures. Father, we, we are um, so moved that you care about us, that you love us, that you would send us your scriptures to guide us in this life, and that you would send us your son to sacrifice himself on the cross for our sins for our misgivings that so often hurt our lives and hurt the people around us and really hurt our world. And Father, I pray as we study your scriptures today that we'll be inspired to trust you and to follow your guidance, God, and that it will help us uh, to overcome the storms in our life. God, I pray for all those suffering, for all those uh, in grief, uh, for all those uh, hurting at this time. And I pray for those who are strong Christians, that today's lesson will inspire them to be even more strong and courageous as we face whatever challenges come our way. Father, we love you and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we're going to read Joshua chapter 1, and then we'll come back and talk about it. The book of Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, 
Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the river Jordan into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, ready for battle, must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are able to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will fully obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Thanks for reading that, James. Okay, the time here at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1 is around 1250 BC. And it's also about 30 days after the death of Moses. God's people Israel, who have been wandering around the desert for 40 years because of their faithlessness, are now at the banks of the Jordan River, about to cross over into the promised land. And just to take a quick note, as I was studying this, it occurred to me, as difficult as the lockdown has been, as difficult as the time we're going through right now, I don't know about you, but I choose now, rather than wandering around the desert outside for 40 years. I, I, I think being locked down in our uh, apartments or homes, um, at least I feel, we're still getting the, the good end of that stick. But um, regardless, I'm not trying to make light of what we're going through. And I pray everyone is staying safe and doing whatever it takes to be safe during this uh, ep uh, epidemic, this pandemic. And yet, um, I think we've got to always be grateful. Uh, and if we look at this, they wandered in the desert for 40 years, but it was because of their faithlessness. Now, here they are, and Joshua, who had been Moses' aide for all that time, has now been called to succeed Moses and lead God's people into the promised land. And certainly, Joshua has some big shoes to fill. Now, we learned in our teaching day uh, last weekend, and if, if you didn't get to see those videos, we'll, we'll put the links below this in the details so you can watch it. 
But we learned that Joshua in Hebrew is another name for Jesus, which means the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation or one that I really like, the Lord gives the victory. The Lord gives victory. And Jesus in the Greek means the same thing. And so Joshua was a kind of savior figure uh, leading his people into the promised land and intentionally so. When the Jews would read about Joshua or hear about Joshua, it would help to shape their image of what the Messiah to come was going to look like. Then, of course, in Deuteronomy 18, another prophecy about the Messiah was from Moses. Moses said, after I go, God will send another prophet like me to lead you. And, of course, the initial uh, fulfillment of that prophecy was Joshua. But the extended fulfillment of that prophecy was Jesus. Here, though, Joshua is now the leader of God's people. He is God's representative to Israel. And remember this, Israel obeyed God's word through Joshua. That's very important. Israel obeyed God's word through Joshua. Now here they are on the banks of the Jordan, uh, about to receive a promise that they'd been given hundreds and hundreds of years ago to Abraham. A promise that they'd have a land of their own. And now this dream, this long-awaited dream, was about to come true. Point number one comes from verse three. And that is when God tells Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot. Point number one, every place you set your foot. Now I want you to imagine as they're about to go in and take the land. Imagine if God gave you this promise. Wherever you set your foot, it's yours. If you live in Leeds, you just go down center of the city, set your foot, and Leeds belongs to you. Go to Stockport, set your foot, and Stockport belongs to you. Kind of brings back memories in the United States of the early pioneers moving westward, and if they got there first, and put their stake down, the land was theirs. Of course, we know, those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, that this was a precursor to the ultimate command of Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, where Jesus told his disciples to go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. And so God told Joshua to take the land, but Jesus told his followers to go and make disciples of all the land. Now, as God told Joshua, I'll be with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Jesus also told his disciples that as you go into all the land, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Now, one very important thing here, though, is Jesus's followers weren't just to go tell people about Jesus. They were to make them into followers of Jesus, baptize them, and then teach them to obey all that Jesus had commanded them. Remember what we talked about earlier. Israel obeyed God through Joshua bringing them God's word. There was an expectation of obedience, and it was the same for Jesus. His word wasn't just supposed to be spoken, but people would obey Jesus's commands through the people that brought them his word. Why? Why this expectation of obedience? We, we in the, the, the modern day world, or perhaps the Western world, we don't like authority. We don't want to be told we need to obey anything so often. And yet, the reason we have to obey it is, it doesn't work if you don't obey it. It's like a, a plan to eat right and exercise. You may know it in your head, but it's not going to work unless you do it. 
God's word won't work unless you put it into practice. You know, I grew up going to church. I grew up with a head knowledge of who God was and, and what he taught. But I would go and sit and listen and leave church and live like anybody else that didn't even go to church. And so it didn't make a difference. It always hurts me when I invite someone to come visit our church. And they say, ah, no, nah, I tried religion. I tried church. It doesn't work. That always breaks my heart because, again, I've seen churches where we might talk about God, but it really wasn't much different than my friends at school or my friends at the workplace. However, when I was 23 years old, I studied the scriptures in our sister church in New York City, and I wasn't just taught the scriptures, but the gentleman studying with me actually then looked at me and said, so Chris, I know you believe this, but is this the way you're living? And for a couple of answers, I said, oh, oh yeah, yeah def definitely. But then the third time he asked me that question, I said, oh, okay, no, I'm not, I'm not completely doing that, but I want to. And so from the very beginning, I, I hadn't known him very long at all, but he was bringing me God's word, and he knew that it wouldn't affect my life unless I lived by it. Then he brought me to a church in New York City where everyone in that church was committed to living according to the scriptures. There was a standard, an expectation of obedience that made that church experience different than anything I'd ever seen. And it reminded me of 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 1 to 5, it, it warns of godlessness in the last days. And it talked about having a form of godliness, but denying its power and how that was actually godless. And that's why so many people may go to church or may encounter the religious world or friends that claim to be Christians but aren't expecting obedience from themselves or those around them in the church. And so it's not different. It's not special. And it's not the bright light of hope that God wants it to be. You know, this is why we are currently planting a church in Cardiff, Wales. And, uh, you know, our dear sister Ella's gone on that planting. Uh, Nick's sister, Rebecca, and her husband, Zach, are leading that church planting. And they've already moved to Cardiff, Wales. In fact, uh, not this next midweek service, but on the 28th of the month, I've invited the Cardiff mission team to come on our, our midweek Zoom with us so they can share with us how things are going. Since we're getting ready November 1st to 15th to give a missions contribution, half of that contribution will go to the UK and Ireland Missions Fund to help support Cardiff, and the other half will stay here to support our youth ministry with our teens, our students, and our young singles here in the church. And so we're, we're, we're planting a church in Cardiff. You may say, but there's already churches in Cardiff. Absolutely. But we want to plant a church there where every member of that church is dedicated to obeying God's word. Because again, that's what changes our lives. That's what makes that church different. We can't make it different. There's nothing good in us except God. But God's word, if we commit to it, sinners that we are, as much as we fall, when we commit to that standard, it's an incredible hope and you see miracle after miracle. We'll talk more about that. You know, Teresa and I have had the privilege of planting churches and also raising up people and sending them out to plant churches. And something we've, we've had the joy of doing uh, on, on several different occasions is a spying out the land trip. Now, next week in chapter two, we'll talk more about spying out the land, uh, if you're familiar with Joshua chapter two. But we would go to those cities we were about to plant a church in. We would uh, walk around the city or drive around the city and we'd get out at certain important spots in that city and we'd put our foot down and we'd say, God, uh, just the way Joshua did, we'd say, God, 
give us this city. As we come here, uh, not, not give us the land. We didn't want to own the city. But as we come here and strive to, to rescue people, uh, to bring them into your promised land, which is your kingdom, uh, your church on earth, and heaven for eternity. Uh, God, give us this place. We'd go to universities in that city and put our foot down and pray, God, please help students here become true disciples. And then to, to be able to start to share our faith and to plant those churches and to see the lives that accepted God's word, that decided to obey God's scripture, to see God work in their lives is priceless. And so that's why we're planning a church in Cardiff. That's why we have family groups, small group ministries throughout the cities that we have churches in. Here in Manchester, whatever family group you're a part of, you are the hope for that area of the city. And so perhaps in a safe way, in a, in a COVID secure way, you and your family group, as you walk around your neighborhood, put your foot down and pray and thank God in advance for the men and the women that are going to study the scriptures, that are going to obey the scriptures, that are going to be baptized in Jesus' name or restored to their faith and help you to win that area of the city. And, and that's what our family groups are all about, taking care of each other spiritually and having a plan to win that area. So if you're a family group in, in, in Stockport or in... Uh, in Sale or Stratford, in Trafford, or in the North, or in Liverpool or Leeds, what's your plan to proclaim to all the land God's given you? Put your foot down, pray, and be strong and courageous. Point number two comes from verse eight, where it says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you weren't, won't turn from it to the right or the left. Point number two is always on your lips. You know, this, this was something that God told Joshua. Keep this book of the law, these, these, these teachings I've given you. You know, I've heard it said that Bible, B-I-B-L-E, simply stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. This is God's guidance to us of how to live here and how to be with him forever. And he says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. And I love the admonition to meditate on it day and night so that it'll keep you from turning from it to the left or to the right. I want to share with you a study that was done recently by the Center for Bible Engagement. Uh, and in the United States, they polled 40,000 people from age eight to 80. And they simply wanted to see how are people engaging with the scriptures. And they discovered that when people read the scriptures only one time a week, and maybe that's even on church service Sunday, uh, where the, the minister, like I did, says, okay, let's open our Bibles. There was a very negligible effect on some key areas of our lives. Uh, two times a week, very negligible. If you read the Bible three times a week, there was a, a blip, uh, a, little, a little, little spike. But for those that read four times a week or more, it literally spiked off the charts. And there was something radical that happened that affected the behavior of people. Listen to this. Feeling lonely dropped 30%. People that felt lonely, if they read their Bibles four times a week, it dropped 30%. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships, either marriage or with your children, with your family, it dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. And, and the person doing the study said, 
This is something people talk about a lot. They feel spiritually stagnant. Perhaps you do. Perhaps you feel spiritually stagnant. They said, just ask the question. Are you spending time in the scriptures? How often are you spending in the scriptures? And if it was four times a week, at least, feeling spiritually stagnant dropped 60%. Viewing pornography dropped 61%. And then on the flip side, things like sharing your faith jumped 200% because people were more confident because they were in the scriptures. Discipling others jumped 230%. And so this is what God is telling Joshua. He's saying, keep this always on your lips. You know, I've got a challenge for us uh, this week. Let's be serious about our Bible study. If you're a guest, if you've not studied the scriptures, ask the person that brought you to sit down and study the scriptures with you the way I shared was done with me earlier. And if you're a Christian, let's be serious about our Bible study. How much time do you spend in the scriptures? Even new Christians, we, sh we should strive to spend, say, 15 to 20 minutes a day at least. But if you're spending more, then amen. I want to encourage you, take notes in your Bible study. Ask questions. Memorize scripture. And I'll give you some ideas of scriptures to memorize a little bit later. And I, wa I want to encourage you that you'll see these changes in your life if you don't just know it here. And it's not just in your heart here, but it's always on your lips. Something God told the people in Deuteronomy is, is teach these things to your children. Uh, whether, whether you're on the road or whether you're at home, talk about these things day and night. It doesn't say keep it always in your mind. Keep it always on your heart. Keep it always on your lips. And that way we won't turn to the right or to the left. And brothers and sisters, I know what happens to me when I stray from God's word. I know what the word produces in me. I know who I was before, and I shudder to think who I'd be if I didn't have the scriptures as the standard for my life. Even in the past few weeks, dear brothers and sisters that I care about, I, I've watched them uh, go through times where they've strayed to the right or strayed to the left and turned to some of these other things that we've talked about. And it breaks my heart because I know, I know it's going to hurt them. I know it's going to hurt the people around them. And I know it's going to hurt the church when we stray from God's word. Now, thankfully, we all fall short and there's forgiveness. But when we make a decision to stray, when we're not keeping this always on our lips, I promise you, these areas of our life, we're, we're going to suffer in these areas. And so I pray that this week, these things can be always on our lips. And as the word is on our lips, I want to challenge you. Let's not have other bad things on our lips. Let's make a decision. For the next seven days, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to argue. You know, Philippians 2 says that we should hold out the word of life without complaining or arguing. As the word of life is on our lips, perhaps we'll notice, let's not complain. Let's not argue. I quoted Pope Francis a few weeks ago when he said that gossip is a, a virus worse than COVID-19. So let's, let's keep an eye on our lips this week that we won't let gossip come out of our lips, but we'll have the word of God always on our lips. Finally, brothers and sisters, be strong and courageous. You know, uh, this is mentioned four times in Joshua chapter one. It's mentioned in uh, verse six, verse seven, verse nine, and then at the end of the book, uh, chapter one, when some of the tribes are about to go over ahead of their brothers and sisters and fight for their brothers and sisters 
to receive their land and the rest that, that these tribes had already received east of the Jordan. Uh, they say to Joshua, they say, we're going to do everything you've said. We're going to go wherever you tell us to go. Only you, Joshua, be strong and courageous. They wanted their leader to be strong and courageous as he led them. You know, if you're a football fan, you want your team to be strong and courageous, don't you? You don't want them to go out there on the, uh, in, in, in the game and be weak and uh, fearful. You want them to be strong and courageous. And the teammates want their team captains and their coach to be strong and courageous. If you're a teacher, you don't want to be a mediocre teacher or one of the weakest teachers. You want to be a great teacher. And so I want to put before you that as Christians, spiritually, do you strive to be strong and courageous as a disciple of Jesus Christ? See, I think far too often, let's face it, we don't. And I think sometimes the devil even gets in our head and tells us that to be strong and courageous as a Christian is wrong, is to be arrogant or to be prideful. No, 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 we need to be humble, but we need to be strong and courageous. In fact, it says strong and very courageous. And so I want to encourage you. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and to put on that full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Brothers and sisters, the devil wants to lead the whole world astray, and that includes you and me. And no matter how strong you believe you are, the devil has a plan for you to lead you astray so that not only will you not make it to God's rest, but you won't be able to help those you love make it either. And I want to encourage you, put on the full armor of God, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, so those flaming arrows of Satan that come at you can be extinguished and that you can take your stand. And not only to take your stand, but to soar above the storm. Now, I promised you some scriptures that uh, could be ones you decide to commit to memory this week. So let me just offer a few suggestions. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Then Psalm 121 says this, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. In James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then finally, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29, it says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So back to our theme for the day, brothers and sisters. Be strong and courageous. The scriptures are clear. The storms are going to come. 
Jesus told us the storm's going to come. And if we build our house on the sand, it will not stand. But if we build on the rock, it will stand. It will withstand whatever storms come. And so let's humble ourselves. Let's be serious about our Bible study with the expectation of obedience. And let God show us the fruit of his word in our lives and in lives around us as he lifts us above the storm. God bless you all. Encourage my soul and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears. Encourage my soul and let us journey on for the night. And I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light of peace. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Oh